So I am going to jump right in because I want to make sure that my colleagues have time for their presentation. So the Southern Plains is my talk. And first of all, I'd like to just give you a list of objectives there that I'd like to go through today with you. Talking about the location because I know we have people from all over the country, so we want to pinpoint where I'm talking about. And then the different cropping systems, and, and there's your list. And then the, end it with the culture of agriculture. So there were, when I was looking at this information, there was two different maps, and I called several different agencies. And the National Agricultural Statistics Service has the Southern Plains, including Texas and Oklahoma. And then the, um, the USDA Climate Hub includes Kansas. So today, I'm going to hone in my talk to um, Oklahoma and Texas. I know people in Oklahoma have worked with some of the staff there. And when I called my colleague in Kansas, he thought that he, he thought that they, they mostly belonged in the northern part. So. so for the climatic conditions in this area, typically you can range from less than 10 all the way up to greater than 55 inches. And if you look here, we have an arid region here, semi-arid in the middle, and then it can go from um, subhumid tropical, and then down here it can be tropical, down at the, the tip of Texas. And then in most of these areas, the evaporation exceeds the precipitation, so farmers struggle with that also. And then we have irrigated farms and dry land farming. A lot of the irrigated farms are here in the panhandle, but yet also in that part of it, um, the water situation, and I'll talk about that, the quantity and quality of water is something that they'll have to deal with in the future. So for Oklahoma, we have four different maps. You're looking at precipitation, topography, um, annual seasonal temperatures, and then um, the rainfall. And also in Oklahoma, there are some small mountain ranges. So the, the, uh, what they call the panhandles of Oklahoma is this part here. And that kind of sets up with the Panhandle in Texas. And then the eastern region of Oklahoma is kind of set up along the eastern, with some of the eastern parts of Texas. And also with um, the conditions in Texas, and I, I found this one for February, there's a lot of diversity with temperatures where you can have temperatures in the 30s in northern Texas in the Panhandle and then all the way down to the 70s at the tip of Texas. And then the growing season length in these areas can be all the way from about 170 days to 365 days a year. So there's a lot of diversity with the, the growing seasons. Um, the conditions can be from snow to freezing rain to tropical conditions. And currently there is a drought in the panhandle of Texas, even though last week they had a inch of rain. We're dealing with severe drought up in this area right now, also in Oklahoma. And matter of fact, on Thursday, we're going to be having a special drought monitor meeting in Amarillo, Texas. And um, currently there's wildfires also in the panhandle. And also that goes along with the diversity of soils in this region where we go from altisols to, um, and in the middle part, it's, it can be alpha-sols and monosols, and then all the way to um, aridosols in the far west, and then we also have vertisols in Texas and Oklahoma. Matter of fact, in Texas, the state soil is called the Houston Black, and that's on the Blackland Prairie, and that's a vertisol. And here's more talking about the soils in Oklahoma, um, this was a better depiction for Texas, but in Oklahoma, you're typically having the, um, the mollusols and, and the alphasols in the central and the inceptosols in the west and the alphasols in the far east, where they have a lot more rain. 
And then for cropping systems in this region, we go from cotton to rice, peanuts, corn, soybeans, sorghum, a great diversity of crops. And also in the southern, which they call the Valley of Texas, you have citrus and some other um, vegetables, year-long growing of vegetables in the southern part of Texas. And then in Oklahoma, you know, I, I mentioned those couple of mountain ranges. And then also there's a lot of native rangeland and introduced pasture. Most of the introduced pasture are in the eastern part of Texas and central, and then also some in the central south. But then towards the west, you have a lot of native rangeland. There is a lot of cover crop research. This is not an all-inclusive list of what research is going on. But we have people from the land-grant universities, uh, the Noble Research Institute in Oklahoma is doing a lot of research and also reaching out to partners in Oklahoma, uh, the University of Oklahoma, well, Oklahoma State University, I guess. There's a few researchers that are doing uh, cover crop research. And then AgriLife Extension, there's ARS in Lubbock. Um, and many of the universities, Tarleton Farms, Prairie View, a lot of those colleges are not doing cover crop research. So we have a, um, a bigger group of people doing research than previous has been done. And then down at the University of Texas in the Rio Grande Valley, they just got a SIG grant and they're doing research on um, some subtropical soil health initiatives. And we're looking at what cover crop would work best out in that region. This is just, this is two slides that I'm going to show you um, with some cover crop research that is going on in the panhandle. The researchers are Dr. Katie Lewis, Katie Lewis and Wayne Keeling of AgriLife. And they were comparing a system of either doing a cotton in wheat rotation or doing cotton continuously with, um, with the right cover. And for their lint yield, they found that the rotation was better than the actual continuous cotton with the right cover. And then the, really their summary slide that they wanted to communicate is that they found that with the cotton re wheat rotation, you would have increased yields. But with the cotton and rye cover, you're actually increasing soil organic carbon. And it may not be a lot, but that's what they're doing with the cover crop. Um, so in the semi-arid regions, there's, there's other issues that they're dealing with, and a lot of it has to do with trying to stop wind erosion, and these cotton plants and seedlings are very fragile when it comes to getting beat up by wind, so some of their objectives are going to be different in other parts of the country. And here I'm going to give two examples of successes. This farmer is in Oklahoma. So he was doing dryland no-till cotton, and he had some of these other uh, crops, which is good. Um, some of the farmers in these regions are typically doing monocultures, either monoculture um, cotton or monoculture wheat. So this farmer did have those rotations, but also um, what he, the thing that he did change was using cover crops. So what he saw for on his farm after doing cover crops was that he did have improved weed control, infiltration, and some of these other issues that, that helped him um, decide that he will be sticking with cover crops. Because remember, when, when you're working with a farmer, it's going to be their decision whether they're going to stick with cover crops, and a lot of times they're going to be convincing themselves. And this farmer, um, I've been on his farm, this is Aaron Hopper. He is in the panhandle also. And he used to be um, doing minimum till, but doing 100% cotton rotation. So cotton after cotton after cotton. And he does some irrigation, some dry land, and he was having problems with wind erosion. So he knew that he needed to do something different. So what he did was he changed his rotation to include some high residue crops like corn and wheat. And he saw that that was also better, but he was still seeing his corn residue blow away. 
because when the wings start, um, they call, and this is kind of funny because I originally am from the Midwest, but when they talk about the wind and the panhandle, they talk, it, talk about it either laying down or standing up. So the wind, when the wind is standing up, you know, it could be blowing 35, 40 and above miles per hour, and that corn residue is still, it still moves around a lot. So then he, um, he decided to try cover crops, and that actually helped pin down his resume. I'm gonna show you a picture of that. And he, was, he also saw savings in using the irrigation water, and then his reduction in wind erosion. Wind erosion is a big deal um, to farmers up in the panhandle. So on his farm, um, and you'll see here up in, up in this corner, he used to have just continuous cotton, and then which has a very fragile residue, even though it's it's stemmy and it's a woody species. But at least now he's using that high residue crop of corn. And over in this one, he's actually using wheat, just his bin run wheat, to hold down that that corn residue. And over in this photo, um, this is his cover crop that he's using after wheat, and that. That is a good looking cover crop. You know, and a lot of times in other parts of the country where we get sufficient rain to grow a cover crop, um, the look of it is going to be different from, from what you see here. And also, in these type of regions, in these semi arid regions, it might take longer. So it's going to take longer, longer to build that soil health. But there's farmers who are convinced of doing this and they're not turning around. And a matter of fact, um, they had their first soil health and no-till uh, farmer meeting in the Panhandle in Lubbock, Texas in February, and over 275 people attended, which is excellent. And then we're going to be having another one in Palestine, Texas. And so we're, um, even though we may be a little bit behind on some of this, uh, Texas and Oklahoma is catching up, which is good, you know, for me to see the conservation. Um, now I'm going to transition to a few challenges in these area, and, and the number one challenge is erosion. And after working throughout the central region in our country, I see this over and over again. Whether it be in the north where I work, the central part, or now I'm working in Texas, erosion is still an issue. So here you have wind erosion, and what happens with wind erosion is it starts piling up, and then they have to come and scrape it off the roads and then, you know, pile it on the side. Whereas when I worked in the central part of our country, what happened was it was mostly water erosion, and then the water, the, um, it, the sheet and reel would take off the fields, it would end up in the ditch, and then the county people would come in with the backhoe and scrape it out of the ditch. So either way you look at it, erosion is still an issue, you know, in most of our most of our country. The other challenges they have is they have fragile soils. Okay, and mostly I'm talking about the panhandle now. And this soil was from um, the La Mesa area, where it's mostly sand. And when you get over 40% sand and the wind starts blowing, the, the sand is going to start moving. In other parts of the panhandle, they have clays and silty clays. Uh, and then they have more irrigation water, so it's not as much of a problem. But here in this picture also, this is what saltation looks like. So in this field, when I took this picture, um, you can tell that the wind was blowing. And when wind erosion starts, it starts as creep, saltation, and then suspension. And this is a picture exactly what saltation looks like. And then the other issue they have is water quantity and quality. So um, the quantity, there's some parts where the irrigation wells are doing fine, other parts where the wells are drying up, and the farmers are going to have to in the future transition to dry land farming. So trying to help the, um, the researchers are trying to study of how to help these farmers transition to the dry land farm. And then once again, there's fragile soil. So these are just some of the challenges. The other ones are wild hog. So this is a picture of hog damage. Here, uh, the Brazos River 
Bottoms is where this farmer was. He was planting, uh, he planted cover crop after cotton, and he was so proud, you know, and you can see some cotton. If you look here, you can see some cotton uh, leftover materials here. But he was so proud. He was doing um, all the different trials of different lawns, what mixes worked good, but one of his issues was that he has a lot of wild hogs. <laughs> so he's going to have the wild um, hog damage rolls. People who are trying cover crops for the first time, they're going to, they'll have to deal with pests. And then also um, the farmers, they need this peer-to-peer -peer network. That's really helpful to them. A lot of them feel like they're alone. Uh, they're taking risk and they're not sure of the economics at this point. So having that peer-to-peer -peer network is a real value to them. So we need to be able to get that established and help connect farmer to farmers so that they can um, work on their challenges together instead of feeling isolated in the moment. Some of the other ones are graze out wheat and um, I know has anyone here um, heard of graze out wheat? Or some of you, some of you okay. So what happens with that is these, the farmers buy these young livestock and then they plant wheat and then they put the cattle out there and they graze out the wheat. Otherwise they graze it to a certain point and then maybe let some of it go to grain. But some of the issues they have with that is that that can be compaction problems. And a lot of times they're not going to move the cattle because they plan on selling the cattle after this is done. So they're going to sell the cattle after this. So they buy the cattle, put it on graze out feed, and then sell the cattle. But here it's showing that you're going to, a lot of these soils get compacted and they have issues. And these issues can last for years. And it can last following the next um, cash crane crop that they have. So having a so um, they're going to learn how to have to manage that or they're going to have to do something different in those systems. The other one is fighting this wind erosion. And when I first arrived, I said, well, what kind of piece of equipment is that? Because when I, when I was out in the field with my colleagues, the wind started standing up. And when the wind starts standing up, it really starts to blow. And I saw this farmer out there and I thought, well, what is that farmer doing out there this time of day? And this is actually called a sand fighter. So they have pieces of equipment called sand fighters that they will both spend hours on. And during the critical wind erosion period, and that typically is going to be February, March, April, up in the Panhandle area, could be different other parts of the state. Um, they will be out on that when they know there's a windstorm coming. The wind is going to start standing up. They go out on this machine and they start building, uh, start, they start tilling and it forms these clods. And these clods of so soil then help break up the wind action. So they're actually trying to form clods of soil using the sand fire. Um, there's fallow and rotations here, just like a lot of the other, uh, like Colorado, Oklahoma, they have a lot of fallow periods. They're using monocultures with the low residue crops like cotton. And then um, perseverance. You know, perseverance is an issue in some of these challenging, you know, these are brittle, these are brittle environments. And this picture is depicting, you can't see it too well, but if you put your, your eye right here on this well, and if you look to the right, this cover crop here is taller and greener, and this is depicting the difference between the left, which had a lot of compaction and issues with that. Uh, this used to be used as uh, a lot of the, the equipment used to be running up and down on the left side, compared to where they're doing soil uh, health principles on the right, and then they're doing no-till and cover crops now. So that's just giving you a depiction of what the soil looks like. So tips for success in this area, once again, it's working one-on-one -on -one with that farmer, asking them what are their objectives, figuring out the, you know, the realistic expectations that, that they may have in talking to them about commitment. 
all right? And then the thinking system, that, you know, it needs to be rotation, timing, cover crops. It's not just one, but helping them put together a system for their own farm. And one of the, the greatest one is knowing your environment. If you get, if you, if you talk to, with the farmer about knowing their environment, and as they get to actually think through the environment, they will come up with a plan to work it out. And it all comes back to these principles. These principles are the principles that are, that, you know, that I have seen work throughout the, the whole central region of our country. And as they implement these principles on their own farm, they will have success. So I'm really enjoying Texas and I appreciate being here to talk.